is a graph showing percentage of revenues derived from tobacco S&P 500 companies. And um, the American brands with the, the largest percentage of revenue coming from tobacco is at 58% and Philip Morris is at 42%. And this slide compares, it's a graph that compares the S&P index to the tobacco-free S&P in index. And as you can see, there's not much of a variance. And at um, some time, the tobacco-free S&P index performed better. So the most significant underlying issue is to make the most return from investments without factoring in the mission in order to grant the most money, or invest in a socially responsible way that maintains mission integrity but risks limiting fiscal growth. <coughs> and these are actually our, one of our questions as well. Uh, what do you feel is most important, uh, making the greatest return on investments in order to maximize grants or investing in a socially responsible way? I work in health. back to the last class we had a tool where we had to one of the questions was if this if you want related in with this one of something to the tune of okay so let's say you invest in this socially responsible way and your um, company goes under is it still worth it if you want to look at it that far and it seems like a lot of people would fall on the side of pretty apparent to most people, but I'm sure that there's some that would object and may not think that investing in tobacco companies is socially irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Well, there's medical evidence. To prove. Right, right, but there's a hard to, you know, yeah. there's some people that may refute that. Yeah. Now, it's, it's also worth noting, though, if you think back to that initial graph, graph, what, what's that? The, uh, performance the one, actually the pie chart. Oh, yeah. Not all of the Bush Foundation money goes toward healthcare research or the healthcare industry yeah. in general. It's going to scholarships, it's going to all across the, across the board funding right, right. to benefit the communities. Yeah. It, isn't it given that if you invest in a socially responsible way that you limit your fiscal growth? I mean, is that just a, sort of a, a given no. that, that no. they And that's what that chart showed over the yeah. course of so you know, just three sure years. It's not up there, though, right? That we can pick that. Pick I want to pick both. Oh. Well, <laughs> they come both. Oh, so wait, we shall discuss that. Okay, so that comes in a bit. But these seem to be the most. Yeah. Things this so is what okay. this was our biggest bump. This as was a group. Big This was what came. As up. we were discussing, it, <laughs> some folks said, "Okay, well, how can we? We need we need money to provide education, so we can get folks information." How can we do that if our money goes bad? And if you recall from the study itself, the wording, you know, how small will our investment universe become? Yeah. So Andrew and Monica have given you a background of our case. Uh, I'm going to continue through the rest of the CAT scan analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, so these are the key individuals and groups affected that we identified. As you can see, there are several, most of which were um, mentioned as part of the background. We have the Foundation Board of Directors and the Investment Committee. Um, the investment managers that um, need to implement any type of investment policy. The grant recipients, um, as well as the broader community as a whole that is, um, is benefited from the grants. And then the National Council of Foundations affiliates, uh, we haven't talked about that, but that's just representative of other foundations. So how are other foundations affected by decisions that the Bush Foundation makes? 
Uh, we determined in this case that the key decision maker is the board of directors, so any sort of investment policy would be decided by the foundation board of directors. Uh, so next we looked at the case from the four different ethical outlooks, first of all being interest-based. Uh, as you recall, interest-based outlook is concerned um, primarily with what are the, the harms and benefits to identifiable parties. So we identified three different interests in this case, the first being um, from the grant seeker's perspective, we want to produce a total return of at least 5% plus inflation with a minimum <coughs> level of risk so that we can continue to support those grant seekers. The second interest is the um, foundation itself. We want to maintain integrity to the foundation's mission and values. And then third, um, as I mentioned, the National Council of Foundation Affiliates. Uh, we want to um, consider the fiscal and social interest of that group because they may be pressured to implement similar policies as the Bush Foundation. Uh, the second outlook is the rights-based outlook. Um, and in that outlook, again, we consider rights protection. So the two rights that we identified were with the board of directors, and they have the right to have complete information upon which to make a decision. And then the second right is the investment managers. And so they have the right to know all the investment policies that they have to implement, and those policies have to be clear. The third outlook is the duty-based outlook. Um, so for that, we identified um, two duties, the social duty, so the foundation must stay consistent with its mission and values. And then the second duty is the financial duty, and that's to sustain uh, endowment for future grants. And then finally, we have the virtue-based outlook, uh, which is based on the two <coughs> virtues we identified. One was responsible, so we want to model a better world through responsible investing. And then the second virtue is integrity, so that's producing at least a 5% return with a min minimum level of risk in order to uphold the mission integrity. Um, so next, we looked at those four outlooks and we identified anything that might be conflicting. Uh, we identified conflicts only with the interest and duty-based outlook, and then we took those conflicts and we prioritized them. And we decided that the number one priority would be to be true to the foundation's mission and values. Um, the second priority would be to maintain solvency. And then the third priority, uh, which isn't nearly as important as the first two, but we mentioned it, is to um, set a positive example through social investing for the National Council of Foundation Affiliates. And then um, finally, we identified what are our principal realistic options available. Uh, so the first is we could maintain status quo, do nothing. Um, the second is to enact a social investment policy, which would be one or a combination of the things that Monica explained around um, the different types of social investment policies. And then the third is to only divest in tobacco stock but otherwise maintain status quo. So we wouldn't implement a social investment policy, but would divest from tobacco. So I'm going to turn it back to Kate. Great. So our final question is, if you were the board of directors, would you vote to institute a social investment policy? And why or why not? And so I think some people in the room are visual learners. Mm -hmm. So to help demonstrate that, we're going to have folks get up, stand across this wall. On the left side of the wall, do you feel that maintaining the status quo, just do nothing as it is, sit on the far left? On the far right would be enact a full social investment policy. Somewhere in the middle would be the only divest in tobacco stock and maintain the status quo otherwise. And if you're some variation of that, stand accordingly. Just say what? Can you describe briefly what the social investment policy? Briefly what the social investment policy?